Thank you everyone for joining us. I'm Barry Ford, President and CEO for Council for a Strong America, the umbrella nonprofit organization that includes Fight Crime Investing Kids and four other um, organizations that uh, mobilize and recruit other important parts of our society. We're here today to celebrate Fight Crime Investing Kids, an organization whose members have been working hard for 25 years to help prevent crime through their advocacy of evidence-based policies and programs that help young people achieve better, healthier, and safer outcomes in school and life. And research tells us that access to high quality early education can help kids achieve those outcomes. Today is also an opportunity for Fight Crime Investing Kids to release this new report. Police chiefs, sheriffs, prosecutors, and violent survivors, preschool works. As you'll hear, this new report not only highlights the progress that this organization has helped create and the impact this work has had for kids, but also the ongoing need to do more. Joining us today is a distinguished group of Fight Crime Investing Kids members. We have prosecuting attorney Carol Seaman of Ingham County, Michigan, National Association of Attorneys General President, Attorney General Carl Racine of the District of Columbia, International Association of Chiefs of Police President, Chief Dwight Henninger of Vail, Colorado Police Department, and the National Sheriff's Association President, Sheriff Vernon Stanforth, who's the Sheriff of Fayette County, Ohio. Thank you all, <clears throat> thank you all so much for joining us today. And before we hear from our panelists, I'd like to first show a short video that helps demonstrate the immense impact that Fight Crime Investing Kids has had and continues to have across the country. Hello to all of the law enforcement leaders who have made Fight Crime Invest in Kids a key leading voice for finding solutions to reduce crime and steer kids toward productive, fulfilling lives. For 25 years, you had, you've been at the helm of efforts to promote access to quality early childhood education, not something that everyone expects a police chief or a DA to talk about, as well as after school programs. And you've made the case that these investments will make our communities safer. I was so proud to be a member of Fight Crime Investing Kids back when I was Hennepin County Attorney in the Twin Cities. As members of the law enforcement community, you're making an invaluable um, contribution to the work we're doing. You get it, and you are the most effective voices for it. Congratulations on this incredible milestone, and thank you for everything you do to make communities all across the country safer and stronger. I want to congratulate Fight Crime, Invest in Kids, for your 25 years of great successful work. I've enjoyed working with law enforcement leaders from Iowa that are part of this important organization. They provide valuable information on how we can strengthen our public safety by supporting programs that work to steer kids away from crime. They've been an important partner to me in legislation. My work with Fight Crime, Invest in Kids has reinforced the need for bipartisan investments in children and families that will end up making a lasting impact on young lives. Hello, I'm Pennsylvania U.S. Senator Bob Casey. Thanks for inviting me to speak to you. I just want to start by thanking you and and congratulating Fight Crime Invest in Kids on 25 years. Hard to believe it's a quarter century. But your work is critical to protecting our children and securing their future. Fight Crime Invest in Kids has been a leading national voice for proven crime prevention strategies Uh, but also on so many other issues, including high quality, affordable early care and learning, as well as after school programs and so much else. So this event isn't simply, and you know this, isn't simply a commemoration of a quarter century of Tara's advocacy. It's a reminder that communities are stronger and they're at their strongest when our children have the resources they need to succeed. When we invest in our children, We're investing in the future for all of us. So thanks again for inviting me to speak. God bless your important work. And here's to at least, if not more, 
25 years ahead. Thank you. What great tributes from those uh, sitting members of the United States Senate. Um, it's been a great uh, 25 years, and we also look forward to a greater impact in the future. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, we're so glad to have our champion members with us today. And to kick us off, I'd like to turn it over to prosecuting attorney Carol Seaman for her thoughts on the importance of early childhood education and the work of fight crime investing kids. Attorney Seaman. Thank you. Thank you very much, and very thank you for the kind words. Uh, this is such an important opportunity to really talk to people about how very important early childhood education is, and how different what difference it makes for throughout one's life. Um, I've been the elected prosecutor in Ingham County, Michigan, since 2016. I was also a young assistant prosecuting attorney here in Lansing for 11 years in the 1980s and 90s when our crime rate was climbing. And our culture responded by harsh and punitive practices from the cradle to the grave. I worked in criminal court focused on domestic violence and sexual assault, and also in juvenile court with youth and child abuse and neglect cases in our child welfare system. And I saw the patterns of poverty, lack of funding of meaningful alternatives, and racially disparate or disparate involvements in all parts of the legal system. And it concerned me then. But it wasn't until later when I worked with the Michigan legislature and I first started putting the pieces together. Uh, a real aha moment for me was when I heard a presenter from the Minnesota Federal Reserve Board at a bipartisan meeting of legislators involved with children's issues. In 2003, the Federal Reserve Board in Minnesota released a research report showing that investment in early childhood education is absolutely the best financial return a governmental unit can make for economic return, better than tax credits and a myriad of other traditional incentives to grow an economy. So it's not only the best economic investment, it also reduces crime, homelessness, and a myriad of other social ills that continue to plague our society. When I came back to prosecution as the elected prosecutor, I was encouraged by the then Ann Arbor, Michigan prosecutor, Ryan Mackey, to become part of Fight Crimes Invest in Kids Network. It has been a vital force for positive change for 25 years, and I'm so pleased to be part of it. And today's report helps explain why the connection between early childhood and public safety is so strong. Young children experience a period of critical brain development during their earliest years. Research shows that the experience children have in those years set the foundation for future development and success. Voluntary quality Early education can put kids on a positive path in life, giving them the foundational cognitive and social emotional skills they need to help prevent later crime. And the evidence backs up this connection. Decades of research across numerous states and on the federal Head Start program show the long and short term benefits of high quality preschool for children's development, particularly for children from families with low incomes. We know that the best way to keep children on a path away from crime as they grow is to reach them as early as possible. The research in today's report backs this up. Studies from across the nation in places as diverse as Boston and Arkansas and New Jersey and Michigan and beyond show that quality early childhood education is a major crime fighting tool in the long run which is why Fight Crimes Invest in Children has been such an important force for positive change for over 25 years. And I have to put a plug in for um, one of those studies. It was a high scope study in Ypsilanti, Michigan, um, and it provides such compelling information. And high scope is just celebrating their 50th anniversary this year, uh, 50 years of success. Now, specifically, these studies show that high quality pre-K programs get children ready to learn when they enter kindergarten. They show that children are less likely to be held back in school. They also show that these programs help kids achieve higher reading and math scores and that these increases persist into later grade levels. Crucially, Research shows that quality pre-K programs can substantially increase a child's likelihood of graduating from high school. This is a vitally important result when you consider that six 
out of 10 prisoners nationwide lack a high school diploma. And that figure illustra helps illustrate the relationship between positive educational outcomes and long-term crime prevention. And investments in early, child, early education, like the ones that fight crime, invest in kids' supports, help to improve these outcomes, close the educational achievement gaps, and make our community safer. When I returned to prosecution after many other positions over 22 years, I came back with a fierce commitment to try to positively impact crime reduction by supporting healthy development of children. I'm proud to be part of the Fight Crime Invest in Kids Network to do just that. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Attorney Simon Seaman. Um, next, we'll hear from uh, uh, Attorney General Carl Racine of the District of Columbia. Attorney General Racine, please. Thank you so much, Barry. I think I have had to follow Carol uh, before. <laughs> And I've not appreciated that. Um, and I wish I could just say I agree with every single word and certainly the passion that underlies uh, her statement. Um, you know, put simply, investing in kids is worth every single penny um, that is invested. We should put millions more into it um, because we all are better for it. And forget about just the economic reality of what an investment in kids means, it so obviously is what our most important obligation as adults is, which is to invest in our children. So Barry, I'm really happy to be here today. In the District of Columbia, the Office of Attorney General is the prosecutor for most of the juvenile crime in the district. Therefore, since taking office, I've made reforming the juvenile justice system a top priority. Here's what we've been able to accomplish over the last six years to address trauma and the root causes of crime, focus on the needs of victims, and provide resources to young people. First, we've established our attend mediation program at the Office of Attorney General. Instead of prosecuting parents for the truancy of their kids, we bring parents and schools together to actually identify the underlying reasons why, reasons related to transportation, safe passage, and other issues that can solve the problem and get their kids in school. We've also supported several diversion programs. My favorite in the District of Columbia is the Alternatives to the Court Experience Program that uses cognitive behavioral science to measure anxiety levels in kids when they first come into the program and then measure the kids after they've been in the program. And to you all in this industry or business, if you will, you know that the kids overwhelmingly who come into the criminal justice system are suffering from severe trauma. And because they're kids and naturally impulsive, when you throw that trauma in the mix, you've got a whole mix of potential problems. And what we know is when we address the underlying trauma by giving kids consistent uh, reinforcement, consistent levels of accountability um, and support, guess what? That anxiety level uh, is better managed. The kids become resilient and invariably they re reduce involvement in inappropriate activity, and thereby we hardly ever see those kids again, which is great. Kids shouldn't be in the criminal justice system. Partnered, uh, we've also partnered with our Department of Behavioral Health on uh, something called the High Fidelity RAP program, provides all kinds of services, uh, particularly mental health, academic, financial support, family counseling, um, and and other services. What's really important here is oftentimes in order to help a kid, you've got to actually go beyond that child and help a family member. Kids need consistent, reliable adults. And the truth is in our society, sometimes kid uh, adults aren't consistent and aren't reliable because they too need support. So 
The last point I'll make about some of the programming that we found successful is that we establish our restorative justice program, the only restorative justice program in the country that is housed within a prosecutor's office. Our preliminary data shows that victims go through this process report a 90% rate of satisfaction and that, that the program importantly significantly reduces recidivism in the offenders who participate. Why is it? Because they have to face the victim and they have to tell the victim why they engaged in the conduct they did, sincerely apologize, and follow through on commitments to change the course of their action. So these are the reasons why I'm so proud to support Fight Crime and Invest Kids. As I told Barry at the outset, as we were preparing for this program, to be honest, I was jealous. I wasn't in that group for years. And uh, now that I'm in it, I'm really proud to, to be a member. Uh, you, your newsletters always provide practical uh, and sensible uh, steps uh, that uh, offices like mine uh, can take uh, to enhance kids. Look, the data is clear, and Carol did a great job of reciting that. High quality pre-K drastically reduces the chances of a kid interacting with the criminal justice system. And here's what else. We need supplemental services to kids even after pre-K, because as we know, a lot of the kids, particularly in urban environments, and my friends in rural settings say the same thing. My experience though is in urban settings. The Influences, community violence, drugs, wrongdoing are sometimes overwhelming. And so a kid who did well in pre-K, set to do even better, can have a setback because of the community influences that kid faces. So invest in kids. An investment in our kids is an investment in our future and it is exactly what is morally right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Attorney General Racine. Really appreciate those comments. Um, I now would like to turn to um, the uh, president of the Air National Associations of Chiefs of Police, Dwight Henninger. Chief Henninger is the Chief of Police uh, in Vail, Colorado, and a longtime member of Five Crime Investing Kids. Chief, we'd love to hear your remarks. Thank you, Barry. It's great to be part of this distinguished panel. Um, as a member of Fight Crime Invest in Kids since 2013, it's uh, great to see this research come out. I think it's what we've all really known about um, preparing kids for life, really keeps them out of the criminal justice system. And, and that's you know what most police chiefs want to happen, have happened in their communities. I'm proud to say in Colorado, we're on the process of implementing a universal pre-K education in our community. So we're excited about that. Uh, Fight Crime Invest in Kids and its members have a lot to be proud of. And we are making the case that for increasing pre and preserving pre-K funding in states across the country and at the federal level. In just a couple of generations, public pre-K has gone from something only a handful of states have offered to nearly every state. Currently, there are 44 states plus the District of Columbia. Recently, increased federal investments have assisted states in getting started in preschool pre pre programs. Just as importantly, this has been a strong bi bipartisan movement. I believe fight crime investing in kids has a lot to do with that. Evidence-based arguments show the connectivity between pre-K and public safety res resonates and, last and builds lasting support, whether in a red, blue, or purple state. Unfortunately, there's still much work to be done after years of slow but steady progress, and uh, the number of young children enrolled in public preschool has decreased in the past few years. In 2019, there were 2.6 million three- and four-year-olds in public preschool across all programs, 44% were four-year-olds and 17% were three-year-olds served. So what do all these numbers actually mean? It means that there's still an estimated 2.5 million children from low-income families that still lack access to preschool programs. Giving more kids access to these programs has the power of changing life, their lives for the better. And from a policing perspective, the power to make our communities safer as these children grow up. So I too support uh, the 25 years of work of Fight Crime Investing Kids, and I'm proud to be part of this research and, and getting it out to the, world, the field. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Chief Hanger. Uh, really appreciate your comments. Uh, next, we'll hear from another longtime Five Common Investing Kids member, the National Sheriff Association President, Sheriff Vernon Stanforth. Uh, Sheriff Stanforth is the Sheriff of uh, Fayette County, Ohio. Sheriff, love to hear from you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, certainly appreciate being here and appreciate being with these distinguished other panelists. It's an honor to represent the state of Ohio and the National Sheriffs. Uh, throughout the country. Uh, I have a long history with the uh, Fight Crime Investing Kids program. Uh, I became sheriff 25 years ago. And that was one of the first programs I became involved in as it was beginning. I had been looking for a type of program that would help service children in our community. Uh, I've been involved many years with our school system. Uh, through, before I was even in law enforcement, uh, more than 45 years ago, I was involved with a program called CETA, and that was an employment program through the federal government that employed workers. And one of the workers that we identified was the need to bring uh, aids, uh, teachers' aids, to our classroom uh, for our preschool program and our, and our Head Start program. And so we were integrating uh, adults and using them as positive role models in our classrooms many, many years ago. And then when I became sheriff and looking for that program that would help uh, augment that, uh, fight crime, investing kids was a natural fit. And I'm so glad that I was able to participate with that program from, from the beginning stages and actively involved in it today. Our children are so valuable. And they're a resource of our future. And I've had a, you know, a vast history of dealing with children uh, through the years. And now those children that I began working with when I was on patrol and visiting classrooms on a regular daily basis, those children are now uh, parents and an integral part of our community. Uh, so the work with this organization has, has helped me become a champion for the investment of early education. Anyone who's been in law enforcement long enough to see how negative cycles play out can tell you that it's much better option to keep a child from getting mixed up in crime in the first place rather than trying to get the same child away from crime after he or she has already come into contact with the criminal justice system. Breaking that cycle is vital. But as Chief Henniger said, we're still leaving a lot of kids out of those programs, and we must do more. We have to do more on a daily basis. The law enforcement leaders of Fight Crime Investing Kids call on lawmakers to invest in and preserve funding for those programs. Federal and state policymakers must work in a bipartisan manner to increase access to these programs, particularly for children from families with low incomes. At the federal level, investments should fund states to establish and expand a mixed delivery system of voluntary early education programs with publicly funded preschools offered in diverse settings in our communities, including in child care settings. To facilitate quality instruction, federal lawmakers should also incentivize states to provide salary parity for preschool teachers in all settings, including public schools and community-based options. These incentives would help boost salaries, attracting a deeper, stronger, earlier childhood workforce, as well as reducing staff turnover. And finally, they should increase investments in Head Start to ensure all eligible children have access to full day school year programs in their communities. We need our communities to have access to quality preschool programs so parents have a choice in selecting what is best for their children. These steps will help ensure that every child has the opportunity to reap the great rewards that research tells us that these programs can create. In my own local community, we decided during COVID, we had, the school system had retrofitted a school bus to make it a mobile lunchroom. We provided lunches to children that weren't able to be present we were providing them with readers. We were providing them with, with a, a network of, of uh, staff that went out into the communities 
and was reaching those children that were now being excluded from the socialization of the schools. Meals were vital. We were feeding them, we were putting food in their stomach, but at the same time, we were trying to put uh, a, a sense of normalcy in their lives. And it's through the funding that comes out of Washington that makes these programs possible to reach every one of the children. And we need to be an advocate for our children across the nation and fight crime and invest children. The best in kids is one of the catalysts to reaching every child in America. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheriff Stanforth. Really appreciate those comments. I, and then I also want to thank all of our panelists for their for your opening remarks. Um, one, they highlight the level of commitment and engagement you all have in this issue and um, the role of the Fight Crime Investing Kids has helped, has helped play in your own work and in your own commitment to public investments for kids throughout the country. Before we begin the Q&A with our panelists, I, I'd again like to show another short video, um, this time from uh, some of our champions in, in the United States House of Representatives on the demonstrating the impact uh, fight crime investing kids over the years. Hello, I am Val Demings, member of the United States House of Representatives, and it is my honor to congratulate Fight Crime, Invest in Kids on your 25th anniversary. Our children are our most precious, most valuable resource, and we know an investment in our kids is an investment in our future. Our goal is to ensure that every child has the opportunity to live up to their full potential. However, these investments must come early and it is imperative that we continue to support preventative programs like early childhood education. Let's continue to work together to ensure our kids get off to a great start. Thank you, Fight Crime Invest in Kids, for all that you do to make a real difference in the lives of our children and in our communities. Again, congratulations and thank you for believing in and investing in our kids. Hey, it's Congressman Fred Upton, Michigan, obviously. Uh, I'm in Washington on a hot day, but I gotta thank our sheriffs, our local law enforcement people for sure, as we all are in the fight against crime. Uh, we need to make sure that we, our law enforcement have the proper resources, and one of them is to work with kids in the neighborhoods, to make sure that those neighborhoods are, sa are sound and safe, and invest in those types of activities rather than figure out an alternative where in fact they might lead a life of crime. We don't want that. So I'm with you. Thank, thanks for what you do. We're going to win this fight together, together. Hello, my name is Tom O'Halloran, and I'm honored to represent Arizona's first congressional district in the House of Representatives. Today, I want to congratulate Fight Crime, investing kids for 25 years of great work. As a former police officer and homicide detective myself, I always enjoy working with the law enforcement leaders in Arizona to find common sense solutions to the problems our communities face. They bring an important perspective to how we can strengthen our public safety by supporting programs that work to steer kids away from crime. Fight Crime, Invest in Kids, has been a great partner to Congress on important legislation. Fight Crime, Invest in Kids understands the need for bipartisan investments in children and families that will make a lasting impact on young lives. I wish them success for their next 25 years. Thank you all um, for that. Uh, we appreciate those uh, those tributes from those longstanding members of Congress. Um, so now we're ready to have a conversation. Um, before we do that, I'd like to uh, let everyone know who is watching us on, um, uh, virtually to use the chat function to um, ask your questions to the panelists. We will um, take as many of questions submitted by, uh, by viewers as possible. So let me start 
by asking a few of my questions. That's the moderator's prerogative. And I'd like to start with a, a question that is, uh, is a jump ball for any of the panelists. Um, so sis, thinking about your career in law enforcement, um, I'd like you to just re reflect on that. And what in your experience uh, has taught you about the importance of early childhood education? Um, can be anything, but that's a jump ball. So who would like to go first? I, actually, let me let me call him. Uh, uh, prosecuting attorney uh, Seaman, why don't you kick us off? That we owe our children and our communities to use our voice and our power to try to prevent crime instead of merely coming in after the harm's been done and trying to pick up the pieces then. Um, you know, there's so much damage. Um, and Carl Racine talked about the trauma that's inflicted on survivors and the whole community. That Those ripple effects of that damage um, continues to plague us decades into the future. So the most powerful thing we can do as law enforcement or as lawyers is to come is to use our voices to really try to prevent this violence and the harm from happening instead of trying to deal with it later. That's great. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, other thoughts from anyone else? Hi, this is Carl. I'm happy to pitch in after Carol. Um, I'll just give you a, a couple of, uh, you know, personal, um, you know, uh, experiences. I'm, I was very fortunate um, as, a, uh, as a child growing up. We immigrated here from Haiti, and my mother uh, was an educator. Uh, so we had to ask her to keep the books away. Um, and so um, I had that amount of discipline every day imposed on me by my mom. I can tell you through sports, I was able to get around the District of Columbia, all the pockets of the District of Columbia, and I quickly realized uh, that my experience at home was a heck of a lot different uh, than many of my teammates. And I realized this even though I also knew that my teammates were every bit as talented as I was, not only on the ball court, uh, but they were smart kids. What really came to me, and it was stunning, uh, was a realization uh, when a few of my friends told me, and it could not have been more than 12 years old, that they knew that my future was going to be quite different from theirs. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, it was only all about where I began in terms of uh, the education, uh, my mom, as I indicated, um, and it was also about the community trauma uh, that Carol uh, cited. As a public defender representing juveniles, I'll be the first to tell you uh, that that work caused me to become depressed. I had to quit the job. Why? The daily misery of seeing uh, my clients and then in the waiting room, seeing their teenage um, girlfriends, some pregnant, and the first comment from a client was how happy he was that he saw his dad as his dad was being relocated from an adult jail and he was able to see him in the yard. Um, this is life in America all too often. And these are kids and we all suffer not just from crime. That is a significant pain when victims are hurting. But we also suffer from the lost opportunity and the lost genius, the lost contribution of our kids. Thank you, AJ Racine, for that. That um, Thank you for sharing that personal story. Um, does anyone else want to comment on this question before I move on to another? Uh, Barry, I... I would just add that I remember as a young police officer uh, participating in Head Start programs and and really finding the value in having those relationship building opportunities as a police officer with uh, the young kids in, in the PK programs and seeing them, uh, you know, learning those life skills early on really was heartening. And and I'm really glad to see this research, uh, you know, prove out that that there is a lot of value in those those early programs. So I'm, I'm excited about this research and really 
I look forward to uh, the outcomes on how it addresses Congress and, and our state houses. Thank you very much for, for that, Chief. Um, let me uh, go to uh, Sheriff Stanforth. I mean, um, what Attorney General we're seeing related and his you know, personal observations is something that we often hear from other fight crime investing kids members that they've arrested or jailed grandfathers, fathers, and now sons of the same family. Um, how, how do you see access to the programs we've been talking about, the early childhood programs? How do you see them as being a part of breaking that cycle of generational participation in the criminal justice system? Uh, the, the panelists here, we're all, we've all been around for a day or two. <laughs> and we've seen in our, in our earlier years, it was the grandfathers and the fathers and the sons. Now we're seeing the grandmothers, the mothers and the daughters are also being uh, uh, arrested and jailed. And the family unit is just breaking down something. Like Many of our children are being raised by grandparents. And I think today we're even seeing a lot of our children, small children, are being raised by great grandparents because grandparents are being incarcerated. Now, that cycle has not been broken. We, we, and we have to break that cycle somehow. I think it's critical that we do. Um, and, and I think the programs that this offered, uh, the funding that will be brought into fight crime investing kids is, is a, a way of breaking that cycle. Unfortunately for law enforcement, we are all, everybody on this panel are reactionary to the needs of our community. Uh, and that's one of the cycles that needs to be broken. And I, I've heard that theme in some of the other presentations today is that we need to be the ones that helps break the cycle, but we are only reaction, reacting to crime. We need to be able to get into our communities and work in our community. And locally, I've, I've, I've joined a partnership with, um, with one of our local agencies, the, the Community Action Commission, which deals a lot with the disadvantaged individuals. Uh, I've been involved with that organization probably almost 45, 50 years now. Uh, my mother was a recipient of that program as a homemaker. Uh, she never worked outside the home, and that was a social network for her early on. We, if we have partnered with that program as sheriff. I've, I've gone to that program, and, and uh, we brought in counselors to our, our jail facility. Uh, we partnered. I, I don't need to reinvent the wheel. I don't need to be the recipient of funding. Let the other entities receive the funding and let them bring their programs to us, and we've opened the door for that to happen. We've also increased our faith-based relationship, not only with coming into the, our correction facility and, and establishing some base uh, for our inmates, but also in the community. But we've, we've retrofitted one of, the, one of our uh, uh, decommissioned schools, uh, elementary schools, and now it's a community center and offering a, 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 a multitude of programming for that community. It's one of the most disadvantaged communities we have uh, in, in my county. Uh, that we reach out to them with meals on, uh, on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, uh, food services uh, and education. We're bringing children in to tutor them. And we're using that. We partnered with the Ohio State University and bringing them in to this small community. We've been able to partner and bring them in to help do some tutoring for our children and help the parents adjust to being, uh, try to get adjust back to being grandparents again. Uh, because they've been playing the role of a parent so long, they need to become what it's like to be a grandparent. And that's breaking that cycle. And this is all these little things that go together to break this, that will break the cycle. No one big class history thing will create that break. It's got to be systematic through everything we do and through our entire community. Thank you for that. Much appreciated. Um, A.G. Racine, um, look, significant changes were caused to everyone's life because of this pandemic. Um, how do you think the power of the impact of early childhood, um, the growth of those programs can help return some normalcy to the lives of family and children over the next few months or next few years? 
I think it's incredibly important now to double down on the concept of uh, early childhood education. And as I've suggested in my prior remarks, and I, I really believe that every speaker so far um, agrees with this concept, we need to also wrap around you know, good services now, even after pre-K. The pandemic obviously caused um, kids to be forced, um, if their school districts had the wherewithal, uh, to learn virtually. We know that a whole new set of kids had idle time, okay? And we know in the District of Columbia that manifested itself in record-breaking number of incidents involving carjackings. Uh, you know, the car thefts would have gone even more violent. We've had some homicides um, that occurred as a result of you know, terrible carjackings. I think it's going to take a lot for us to bring those kids back because they have been influenced in ways that I don't think um, a normal school environment and resources there um, would have uh, caused them to follow the flow of criminal wrongdoing. Uh, and so I really think that now is a point of urgency to try to do what we can to actually put the genie back in the bottle. The best thing about kids is that they're malleable. Um, we need to work on that malleability and bring kids back into the zone of education, positive activity, not activity that invariably leads to wrongdoing, crime, victims, hopelessness, and death. Thank you for that. Um, Chief Henninger in Colorado, um, you mentioned it in your opening remarks. Uh, you have an opportunity to create a universal pre-K program. Uh, what are your what are your hopes and expectations for the impact of that program throughout the state? Well, I know that our chiefs are very excited about this opportunity, and uh, clearly uh, the payoffs will not be for maybe our in our careers. But uh, participating in this panel and uh, reading the the research, it reminds me how important that research will be for Colorado as they implement this system. Our state legislature, and even more so, our governor is really one hundred percent behind this, and so I'm confident that it will be executed in a positive manner. And the chiefs are are very supportive of that. So we're excited. It's great, thank you for that. And the last question I have for the panel before I open it up to uh, audience questions is for you, uh, Prosecutor Seaman. Um, so over the past decade, um, you know, we've seen a significant increase in, um, in the availability and the programming and the funding for high quality pre-K, but as you all have said, no, we're not reaching all the kids that need it. Um, it's uh, you know, 2.5 million kids who don't have access to it. Um, but in Michigan, you have a, a pretty significant program, um, the Great Start Re uh, Readiness Program, that Fight Crime Investing Kids member played an important role in supporting and, and expanding. Please talk a little bit about how the bipartisan nature of the support for that. I, that's what I really want. I mean, this is not a partisan issue. This has been an issue that you know, Republicans and Democrats across the country have always supported. So talk a little bit about your experience in Michigan. Sure, and I'm excited to do that. I want to make, make one more comment about another of my aha moments. Um, it was a, a doctor named Dr. Bruce Perry, a, psychi a psychiatrist who many of us are aware of, who deals with how the brain is rewired by trauma and then how we can help heal the brain. He's worked with children in Waco, Texas, and most of the crises and uh, huge events in the United States and Canada. Um, and what he talks about is consistency and well-regulated adults can help children then to become well-regulated and succeed. So that fits right in with what we're talking about. He, he talks about it in for foster care and other settings, but it's really important. Now, going back to what you actually asked me, and as I mentioned in the beginning, research teaches us that quality pre-education not only is beneficial for the children and families who participate, and not only does it reduce crime and all the damage to victims in society caused by crime, but it's an affirmatively a financial financial benefit to our society. And 
you know, as I mentioned, the 2003 Federal Reserve Report demonstrated it's the single best financial investment a government entity can make. And in 2011, our Republican billionaire business owner governor spearheaded substantial investment in early childhood education through his Great Start Readiness Program because he fundamentally understood the positive economic impact this has. Uh, so that's one piece. It's not even the piece that we might focus on the most, but as a businessman, he did. And that really got it going here in Michigan. Our current Democratic governor has supported and expanded this a Great Start Readiness Program and just recently in the budget has put a great deal more money into it because she and so many of our lawmakers in the legislature realized that a safe state with well-educated, thriving children is not and should not be a partisan issue. Thank you for that. Much appreciated. Um, we don't have any questions in, in the chat. So um, I am open to um, just having us close this out. Um, what I'd like to do then is invite any of you to make any closing remarks you may want. Um, there's no pressure from me. You know, just let me know if you don't want to do it. But um, let me take the point of privilege to start this by saying, one, I am deeply appreciative of all your comments, deeply appreciative of your work with um, Fight Card Investing Kids over the years, um, with the staff and other members in this organization. Um, and I want to recognize the commitment that each of you have had to our work, wherever you are, um, and have been impactful in moving state and federal policy with your voices. I want to thank you all for that, just from my own, again, point of privilege. But any closing comments from any of you? Well, Barry, it's Dwight. Um, I, I would just like to, to comment that uh, in your report, you document a police chief who uh, commits uh, some of his successes to his participation in the Head Start program. And so if we've been doing this with some, uh, a broader group of folks from, uh, you know, all the kids uh, that we're missing right now and all the kids we've been missing for the last 20, 20 years, um, just think where we would be. So it's, it gives me a lot of hope for, for the future of our society. Thank you that, for that, Chief. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is Carl Barry. Just thank you so much. And, um, you know, I'm, I am thrilled to have uh, had a chance to be on this panel with uh, such incredible uh, leaders. Um, every dollar spent on, on the investment in a kid redounds exponentially to society's benefit. The case has been established. We need more investment. Thank you for that, A.G. Racine. Anyone else? I, I want to make a few comments. Just to, just I want to sure. thank you and for all the participants here as well. It's, it's been an honor. Uh, one of the things I want to remember one, one, to, when we leave this, we're leaving the fact that there are a lot of children that are being left out of these programs. Even though we, we focus today a lot on preschool, uh, I'm a participant in a P16 council, which is preschool, preschool all the way through a, a college degree, that we're finding out what's missing in, within our educational system. Uh, and making it more affordable and more accessible to our to every age group. Uh, and uh, reading, uh, we we do a reading. Uh, we collect books and distribute it to our children uh, throughout the year. Uh, it, it's opening their eyes to a new world, um, and more than even more so than uh, what they'll find on their uh, their, their phones. Um, uh, reading a book is, is valuable, uh, and it's establishing a good base for our children. But we need to remember that uh, the investment we make in our children at an early age, preschool, kindergarten, first, second, third grade, is valuable. I remember having it early on in my career, I was in a, in a hall room of one of our schools, and a first grade teacher was standing in the hallway, and she looked and she said, I can look in that classroom and I can pick out which kids are going to be in jail in 20 years. And that was alarming. And she was accurate. She, she had been doing this long enough. And that's a cycle that that's one of the cycles that must be broken. If we can identify a classroom teacher can identify a vulnerable uh, child at the age of six, uh, of what path they may be taking. Why can't we get in there and break that cycle at that age or, or, or even earlier? 
uh, and, and give the teachers a tool to help break that cycle. And I think funding is critical to make that happen. Look, I want to I want to thank you all for for your comments uh, and your participation in this panel. I'll just leave it with this. This is something that you've all alluded to or, or said outright. Um, one of the, um, it's not just that it's the right thing to do, it is. Um, <laughs> investing in early childhood education, investing in pre-K. But think of the potential we're losing by not doing it. Um, each of you alluded to this, each of you said this. I mean, the potential that we are losing as a nation, the potential strength we are losing as we are trying to compete as a nation across this world, um, economically and socially in terms of um, our culture and our character as a, as a, as a national community. Um, we need to do this for ourselves in a selfish way. We need to do this because this is how America remains strong. And on that note, I will uh, I'll close out the panel. Again, thank you all for your participation. And I look forward to, uh, to working with each of you um, again as we, as we move forward in this fight. Thanks again. Much appreciated. Thank you.